Canada's methods of organizing Japanese Canadians had been less civil than America. This was because, unlike the United States where families were generally kept together, Canada split them up and had sent the males of ages 18 to 45 to road camps in the BC interior to pick sugar beets or to internment in a prisoner of war camp in Ontario. The women and children now separated from their husbands and fathers were moved to six secluded towns in British Columbia where living conditions were very poor. Times of war were slowly moving. Both Allies and Axis were facing heavy casualties. Though as time had passed, people were becoming more and more xenophobic towards Japanese Canadians. By 1943, there were 12 camps throughout Canada, in which 10 of them were in BC. As can be seen in this map, two of the 12 camps are prisoner of war camps. Nevertheless, innocent Japanese Canadians were still sent here, and the other 10 camps are located in BC, as far away from the coastline as can be. These camps were all to be located in isolated places. Canadians needed to, be, needed to be sure that these enemy aliens would not act as spies. The Japanese Canadians had nowhere else to go except for these camps anyway. All their land was taken away. Despite earlier government promises to the contrary, the custodian of enemy alien property sold the property confiscated from Japanese Canadians. The proceeds were used to pay auctioneers and realtors and to cover storage and handling fees. The remainder paid for the small allowances given to those in internment camps. Unlike prisoners of war of enemy nations who were protected by the Geneva Convention, Japanese Canadians were forced to pay for their own internment. While conditions likely varied from camp to camp, general conditions were poor and living in internment camps was a hard life to live. Many families were forced to live in extremely cramped quarters with 10 other families, sharing a single room and stove. Some camps, such as Slocan City, didn't encompass enough resources to house the huge amounts of people admitted into the camps. Consequently, the majority of people were placed in tents until there were houses available. Even so, one would think that moving from a tent to a house would be a step up, but even this wasn't true. Most houses consisted of panel boards with no insulation, rickety walls, and maybe a stove. During the harsh winters, many Japanese people put lanterns under their beds to try and keep warm. Furthermore, due to the inadequate government funding, these internees were provided with the worst possible provisions. Food was little, clothing was small, and water was scarce. Collectively, all of these conditions were torturing and several people died. This is an image of Lemon Creek, BC, which is one of the better internment camps. As you can see, despite being considered one of the more adequate camps, it was still extremely overcrowded and appalling. After the victory over Japan, the federal government moved to evacuate Japanese Canadians from British Columbia altogether. These evacuees were given the choice between deportation to Japan or transfer to areas east of the Rocky Mountains. The majority decided to remain in Canada and decided to move to Ontario, Quebec and the Prairie Provinces. The war had been over, but the Japanese still were not given full rights to live where they had wanted. Not until two years after the war were they given their freedom back. These Japanese Canadians had faced six years of turmoil, their property had been confiscated, lived with nationwide hatred, and their future demolished. They tried to forget what happened, but it was almost impossible. Reconstructing their lives was no easy task, and for some it was too late. The elderly Japanese people had lost everything they had worked for all their lives and were too old to start anew. While the younger males had their vital education disrupted and could no longer afford to go to college or university, others had been given the responsibility of becoming the breadwinners for their families, but property losses compounded by long-lasting psychological damage made it impossible. 
these people had been victimized, labeled enemy aliens, imprisoned, dispossessed, and homeless. One cannot help but lose their sense of self-esteem and pride in their heritage. However, things were going to change. First, with Lester Pearson's changes to the immigration laws in 1967, the first new immigrants in 50 years arrived from Japan. These post-World War II immigrants were similar to the first arrivals in that they are predominantly young men. But unlike the early immigrants, they were highly skilled professionals from Japan's industrialized urban middle class. These new immigrants also added much to the richness of Canadian population, as these people restored many cultural traditions and revitalized the Japanese community that was struggling to recover. Furthermore, after a 10-year struggle, the redress settlement was announced in Parliament on September 22, 1988. This agreement was a huge step to recovery from Japanese internment. It included an acknowledgement of the injustice of the wartime events, individual payments of 21000 establishment of a community fund of $12 million, clear, clearing of criminal records for those charged under the War Measures Act, and restoration of Canadian citizenship to those exiled to Japan. The internment of the Japanese Canadians was injustice. One day before Pearl Harbor, they were innocent Canadian citizens. The day after, they were guilty enemy aliens who were a menace to society. Japan's declaration of war against America caused every Japanese person in North America to face confiscation of property, six years of horrible living conditions, and a lifetime of sorrow. Trying to forget this injustice was hard on the Japanese Canadians and Americans who faced life and hardships in these camps. Both governments tried to apologize to Japanese with civil and social benefits, but nothing can ever heal the emotional wounds which had been imprinted on the victims of Japanese internment in Canada and America.